Hello and welcome back to another episode of Architecture Answers. My name is Sean and I'm an architectural graduate. I've just finished my part three exams and I'm just awaiting the results. Today I'm going to run through some answers or typical guidance answers for some previous questions and just to give you a direction on where you should be going with your answers. In my last video, we went through construction legislation, and today we're going to go through some typical questions from procurement and contracts. Let's get started. You tender the works of a project, and six tenders are received. However, two have been amended, with items excluded and specification changes. One was received 30 minutes late, and three were substantially over budget. A. Set out how you would advise your client about these tenders and their options for 25 marks. Let's break that down into the simplest bits that they're kind of giving us. Two of our tenders have been received, but they have exclusions and specification changes. One was submitted late, but only by 30 minutes. And then the last three, the last three have been substantially over budget. Starting off, I would talk about the first tender that was late because that's possibly the easiest one to actually get into. I would write to the client saying, you know, Dear Vanessa, uh, as you can see, uh, tender blah <laughs> was received 30 minutes late. We have written to them requesting you know, information as to why that might be. If they have a valid excuse such as, you know, there's a blackout or uh, you know, something completely out of their hands that prevented them from submitting on time, then you can allow it. However, if they you know, have no real reason, then you have to disqualify them from the tender selection. And not only that, I mean, if your tender is late and they don't really have a justifiable excuse, that would probably look bad on their own internal logistics and you might want to not choose them anyways. So just to you know, temper their expectations with which this tender, because some people, their clients, some, sometimes the clients will you know, recommend and they want a certain builder to be put on the tender list and then, you know, they disqualify themselves for whatever reason, you have to like spell it out for them that it might not be great to hire their nephew or... Then I would go into the second bit, which are the two tenders that came back and they had variations and, you know, whatnot and alterations to the brief in their scope. Firstly, I would be saying, you know, that we have reviewed these and we have sent them off to our quantity surveyor who is currently looking at them. The types of alterations or changes that you might expect in from a builder off of a bill of quantities, I mean, the first one might be, say they exclude the ironmongery. This is kind of typical because they don't, you know, service that and we can easily go off and find door handles and that kind of stuff elsewhere. That's not a problem. You can just literally put that as a PC. So if, if they came back and then, for example, they wanted a crane for the site where we had previously specified manual installation, we would need to look at that ourselves and our own management for the site and make sure that it's going to work. If we come to the conclusion that a crane is actually needed, we would have to go to the other tenderers and give them an opportunity to quote for same. This then might be, in fact, the reason that tenders, you know, four, five and six have came back uh, substantially over budget because they're taking these sort of things into consideration, but they haven't actually put them into writing to us. Uh, they just know that you know certain elements are going to cost more than what they're saying. Um, so it's really good to have the corner surveyor on the ball, checking these things out, and really having you know a management plan for the build and how it's going to work. Then finally, I guess I would just say to the client that a, a full set of tender returns is a really good sign, and I would try to keep things upbeat and positive. I would say, you know, it seems that there's an appetite for this project and for the work, and you know, even if we have to delay it and go out to tender again because of all these amendments that we're seeing and changing, that it shouldn't really be a problem. Part B, your client asks for advice about completing the works as a series of separate contracts for different elements of the works. Discuss the advantages and disadvantages for 25 marks. Firstly, I would be saying that the advantage could be that you as the client are going to run the project and 
you're going to have a lot more oversight over everything and a lot more control over subcontractors. You can specify very specific contractors that you want for very, you know, uh, detailed work. So say you had something that you really wanted to be done to the cornices or you really wanted a very specific ironmonger or you wanted whatever, whatever, a certain fireplace, but you wanted them to be installed by the uh, supplier. You can then take complete control of the project and make sure that these specialists are all working and that they're working in tandem and in the right place, the right time. It's a lot of work, but you know, it can be really good. Whereas like sometimes contractors, they don't want to take on all that, especially if it's like a really specific or specialized job and they're just generic contractors. They might not want to actually go into all that detail. Thirdly, you would say that if the client wants to take it on and they're really conscious about budget and cost, they then have complete control over that. I mean, they can really specify down to the bolts and the screws, like what are we going to be using for this building? And that's, again, a lot of work, but really good for if you're con budget conscious. Fourthly, it can be really easy to determine a contract with a contractor if you're the one that's running the whole show, if you're running the whole site. If a contractor is the one that's, you know, your site manager and your uh, PSCS and whatnot, everything on site, firing him can be a huge problem. <laughs> so if you are the client and you are taking on this role, not necessarily as building it yourself, but if you are taking on the role of management, then, you know, it's a huge weight to be able to know that you can just get rid of him. Finally, the last point I would probably make would be the liability and things. So Yes, it does mean that the client will be more liable for things, but it also means that the individual contractors that he's quoted for all these like specialist works, they are all individually liable for their own work, um, rather than having you know uh, all risks from like a main contractor that like covers everything else. You have individual people that you can point to and say that wasn't good enough, you know, reimburse me whatever. That's not really how it works, but you get the you get the gist. <laughs> Next, I would move on to the disadvantages. So you have kind of we've kind of touched on these before. This being that if you are the client and you are running this project, you are running this project, <laughs> and that is a ton of work. It is a ton of responsibility. There's a ton of liability that goes with that, and yeah, it's uh, no easy feat. So secondly, if you're a client and you're doing it, but you're inexperienced, that's going to be really, really tough. And then you're going to lean on other people, uh, especially the architect. And, and, you know, there's going to be a fee for that. If you're constantly trying to ask questions and ring up and you don't know things that you should know, that is a problem. And you might be trying to avoid to incurring costs and they might just come anyways. Thirdly, if you are doing this, you also have to make sure that you're doing all the payment certs that you're doing all of the insurances and liabilities and checking all of this stuff. Again, that stuff is largely out of the mind of people who just take on a project. So if you're trying to build your own house, let's say, but those things are really important and you can't just not do them. So all of your certificates, all of your um, certs that you're going to be getting, you need to make sure that you have all of them and that they're all lined up and locked up for final submission. You also need to make sure that, that your insurances are all in place, that there's adequate insurances. I mean, there's a whole host of them that you're gonna to need to get. This is usually just handled by the contractor, but if you're the one doing it, you need to manage it. The next one would be you have, there will be issues with say, you know, site hoarding or site access and, you know, the timelines for all the different contractors coming in and doing their works. You need to manage all of that. And you need to ensure that everyone is aware that, you know, on a Thursday, let's say contractor B has to make sure that they close the site uh, because contractor A won't be there until whatever time the next day or certain days, you know, it might go A, B, A or whatever, whatever. You need to make sure that everyone is fully aware and that everything is going smoothly. That is a messy process and that can lead to issues where you know there's certain liabilities where you have one contractor a came in did some work and then contractor b came in and they damaged some of this work that a did but they're saying that they didn't and that a just left it like that and a comes back and then they give out and so there can be kind of messiness in trying to manage these people because they don't work together they're not they're completely separate uh entities 
and they don't necessarily want to work together. Whereas if you have a contractor and he's using the same contractors on every single job, there's a you know rapport and they understand what they're doing and how they're running things. Finally, I would just then conclude that. I would just be saying that um, the although there is a lot of work and there is a lot of things that you need to have lined up and ready for this project, uh, it will give you better idea on time, quality, it will give you experience, you will have more knowledge about insurances and all this kind of stuff. But the main thing is that people will have more control. That if that's what they want, that's what they're signing up for, and they are aware of all of the things that could go wrong or the responsibilities that they are taking on and they feel, feel fully equipped for that, fire ahead, no problem. Next, when the project from the question above is due to resume on site under a traditional contract, you request the following documentation from the new contractor. Briefly explain the purpose of each and how it may be used during their works. So A, for 10 marks, contractor's program. Simply put, the contractor's program is a program that they give at the start of the job and it's basically what is going to be compared to the entire way along the job to see are we on budget, are we to time, uh, are extensions of time valid, why are they valid, all this kind of stuff. On the contractor's program, you're going to have the site location and the site entrance, location of site compound, the materials and equipment that are going to be needed for the site, plans and particulars for the project that were granted under planning. You can have work methods for the permanent and the temporary works, timeline for the development, organization for the subcontractors and when they come in and off, what they're going to do. And then finally, the details for absolutely everything for the timing, the arrangements, the agreements, all that kind of stuff. Next. B, contract guarantee bond for 10 marks. So the contract guarantee bond is a form of insurance for the employer against the contractor. And it's just to ensure that they do finish the works and that they can pay you if they go in under and they can't complete the works. So it makes sure that the project is done to a completely satisfactory standard for the client. So the contract guarantee bond allows the architect to go to the contractor and say that they're not happy with certain parts of the works and that they need to redo them. If they don't redo them, you can then get another contractor to come in, use the original site uh, compound for contractor A, do the works, and then charge the contractor A for the works if they aren't willing to redo it. So the bond is going to make sure that that is paid in full. This obviously will delay the works and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the contract bond will help with that. C, contractors insurance policies for 10 marks. Uh, honestly, I'm just going to leave these on the screen because there's so many of them and they're all really relevant. So if you don't know what they are, just go look them up. The main ones, though, being contractors all risks, motoring and employee. Next, we're going to move on to D. Explain how you would assess a claim for an extension of time given three examples and making reference to relevant documentation and the duties of the contract administrator. That's fairly easy if you've worked on site. You will have 100% done these before and you kind of know what is and isn't uh, relevant in these cases, but always, always refer to the contract. That is your saving grace. It said at the start of this project that, or the start of this question that it was a standard uh, contract used and under the ORA AI standard contracts, you know, yellow form, blue form, these sort of things, you have section 30. And that's where it talks about delays and, you know, how to resolve them, what is actually needed to qualify for a delay. And honestly, I would just go straight copy and paste from that. So how would I assess the claim? I would assess it by comparing it with the ORI AI section 30. Then it says that it wants you to give three examples. So the first one would be force majeure, which is almost like an act of God or something that you 100% could not have anticipated. This might be, you know, the blip, for example. Uh, no one saw that coming and you can't really do anything about it. Secondly would be inclement weather. So if there's, you know, a blizzard or a typhoon or something like this. Don't make unnecessary journeys. You can't necessarily uh, prepare for that in adequately enough. And if that delays the project, no problem. Thirdly, you could have a shortage of labor or materials or inability to get such. This was certainly a problem when we had Brexit. I mean, everything has been slowed down and we, could, we found it really difficult for years to actually get stuff on time. 
that's kind of coming back now, which is great. But yeah, those would be the three I would actually go for it off the top of my head. Lastly, it says to make reference to the relevant documentations and the duties of the contract administrator. So typically the contract administrator is the architect and the role of the contract administrator is to administer the contract. But what that means is typically when you have an architect at design stage, you are um, beholden to the client and their wishes. Whereas once you go into construction stage, it becomes very different. You're beholden to the contract. And the contract is between the client and the contractor. So you have to act impartially to the to both of them. So the client might not want you to actually give the extension of time, but you have to say, no, no, no. They, I've looked at it. I've looked at their reasons. I've compared that to the contract. It is within the rights of the contract to request this, and I am going to give it to them. Because you have to. So that's uh, that would be my advice for it. For the next question, it asks, you have been appointed as architect for the refurbishment and extension of protected structure above, currently in use as office and in poor repair. A, list the design team that you would propose for this works for 10 marks. Pretty simple, okay? Especially if you've done a protected structure job before, you just have to think back to, you know, who was on your team. Firstly, you have the architect. Of course. <laughs> I'm going to put them first every time. You would have... Uh, PSDP, and then POCS later on. But you for the design stage, you would have um, M&E, you would have structure, you could have fire consultant, a DAC consultant, you could have an architectural conservationist, you could have an acoustic um, engineer. I think that would probably be it. But if I've forgotten anyone important, please educate me in the comments below and just leave it there. Next, B. Comment on insurance arrangements for this project for 10 marks. So this would basically be the same as what I would put previously um, when it comes to insurances. So I'm just going to leave them on the screen again. C. Outline the advantages and disadvantages of re-roofing these buildings in advance of the main contract works for 15 marks. So this goes similarly to the question that we did earlier. And, you know, what sort of stuff would you put for it? Starting off with advantages. The first one being that doing the roof for a protected structure might require really specialized skills and you might need to actually tender specifically because there might not only be a couple of people in Ireland that actually do this kind of work where you have, you know, old, you know, rotting beams and you need to reinforce them correctly, but, you know, tastefully. And this isn't kind of typical work for contractors. So it might be easier to get that person in and they might be too expensive to do the whole job or they might specialize just in roofs and you need to know that. And that's, that would be one advantage. No. Secondly, it might be better to re-roof the project ahead of everything else because it will stop any damage appearing to the rest of the project. And that, you know, will help you moving forward. If there is huge structural problems with the roof itself, and it could be at risk that of collapse at any point, you need to get in there and fix that ASAP. But even, you know, it could be time sensitive that you get that done and you need someone to come in and just do it before they can even tender for the rest of the project because it might be that big. You could need a crane or something that is going to come on site and it might only be needed for the roof. And, you know, having a contractor come on and just do that specific part of the project and then take the crane away to allow movement for the rest of the project, that could work really well. Next, we're going to move on to the disadvantages. The first one being, if you do re-roof the building before you go and do the rest of the works, this could actually inhibit the second contractor that's going to come in there because he might have actually needed to bring really heavy materials or machinery in through the roof space and that would like protect the front facade and things. So yeah, you need to be aware of that and especially have your program dialed in that you know the sequence of events and that it can actually work in this manner. Secondly, it's a hassle to tender twice and it will cost you more money to tender twice because you're producing two tender packages. Insurances, you know, come in. I would always kind of go for these where I'm going to go for the practical, logical, experienced answer. <laughs> I'm going to go for check the contract, I'm going to go check the budget, and I'm going to go check the insurances. They're kind of my key go-to uh, thought processes for every single question. So I would just go for that. And I know that the insurances are going to be different. 
your insurance might be difficult because say they le- contractor A that has done the roof leaves and then B comes in and they damage something, who is liable, yada, 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 you get the idea. Part D for 15 marks. Explain the difference between using a blue form and a yellow form of the RIAI contract for this refurbishment works. Super easy, everyone knows the difference. Uh, you have the blue form of contract, which is lump sum, and then you have yellow form, which has a bill of quantities. That is more or less the only difference. That is the main difference between the two. What does that mean if you have a lump sum versus a bill of quantities? Bill of quantities, generally you have a quantity surveyor who has produced this bill of quantities, and it goes through everything that is going to be in this project. Everything from all the windows, all the screws, everything. That can take a lot more time to prepare when you're doing your tenders, uh, but it can actually save you a lot of money because if you just have everything as a PC and then, you know, hits start coming in and then they start asking for more money for certain things that weren't uh, under the scope at the start of the project, things get difficult. And it's much easier to have something to compare it to the entire way through. So I'm hoping that was a much quicker episode than the one before. So I'm just going to leave it at that and hopefully make a couple more of these. I might even make some of these into TikToks or something, just like quick fire answers. And yeah, if you're interested in that, please like, share, comment, put all that kind of stuff into the comments below. I really appreciate it. Slongafall.